Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. Hello, Joy, uh, uh, Joy of Coding. Nice. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Mark, for uh, the great first talk. I left uh, a bunch, so <laughs> that was great. Um, but coding, joy of coding, what is joy of coding all about? Well, I think part of it is solving that solution, right? We all get that satisfaction of s fixing an issue or not uh, and laughing about it later on. Uh, but a big part of it is as well the learning process, right? The, the industry is continuously moving and we need to stay up to date. And a lot of time, it's fun to learn something new, but it can also be quite frustrating. So that's what we're going to talk about today about. We're going to talk about how your brain is learning new languages or learning new programming languages for that matter. Now, I am Simone de Geit. I come from the Netherlands, and as already was said, I uh, graduated as a speech and language therapist, but I'm currently working as a Java and Kotlin developer for open value. Well, with that being said, we have about 30 minutes, so uh, we dive immediately in. Today you're going to hear about a lot of different concepts, uh, different topics, so I want to invite you for any given moment in time, if you want to write something down, please do, uh, so that you will be able to tell that colleague on Monday what you heard and what you learned today. Well, with that being said, Let's start with our memory storage. So where is our memory being stored? We all know this cute little fish, right? It's Dory from the Disney movie Finding Nemo, and she's super kind, lovely, friendly, uh, helpful, but she has this eeny, meeny, tiny problem, and that is that she forgets everything that has been said to her or that has happened before the here and now. And that's quite inconvenient. And if I would like analyze that, it would look like she has only her short-term memory to rely on. But what is short-term memory? Well, short-term memory can be compared to a RAM disk, for example. It's a storage place where you can store a limited amount of data for a limited amount of time. And that is very true for the short-term memory, because the short-term memory can only hold two up to six chunks at the time, with every chunk a time to live for about 30 seconds. So that's not a lot at all, right? But what is a chunk? Well, a chunk can be anything. A chunk can be a letter, it can be a word, or it can be an entire concept based on the knowledge that you already have. Let's say we have this line of code. If I would now cover it up, and I would ask you, can you please write down the line of code that I just showed you? I can bet that a lot of you guys will have issues doing that. Why is that? It's because the letters of the variable name are put in such an order that it, they don't make sense to us. It's not something we recognize. Even if we would pronounce it, it's, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel natural. So our brain has a hard time clustering it together. Very different from the data type string that we see in the front. That can be clustered into one chunk, leaving a lot of extra space for the other chunks. If we know that, if we, if we learn that, you can imagine that using abbreviations can be quite costly for your brain, right? Only if you use abbreviations that are fully automated, let's say AVG for average or MAX for maximum, those abbreviations are so commonly known that when you see it, you can immediately chunk it into one chunk. But for custom abbreviation, they take up a lot of space not most of the time, and we don't have a lot of space. So be careful when you, uh, when you write code and you, um, you think about that. If we look at this other example, even though the line of code is longer, it doesn't take as much chunks up as the previous line of code, right? And if we would introduce design patterns and we would say, okay, every time uh, the Boolean, uh, the type data type is Boolean, we start our variable name with is, we can even chunk that together. So we can be conscious about making sure we are efficient with our data storage for short-term memory. 
But still, we can only do so much, right? Because it's still two to six chunks at a time, so it doesn't grow a lot further than that. We need something else. You won't be surprised that that brings us to the long-term memory. And with the long-term memory, I have another Disney analogy for you. The elephants of Jungle Book. The elephants of Jungle Book swear that they never forget. And in that sense, they have, they very heavily depend on their long-term memory, right? And the long-term memory can be compared to a hard disk. It's a storage place where you can save a lot of data for an indefinite period of time. So how does that work? Let's say you see this creature for the very first time. You've never seen that creature in your life before. So you look at it and you cannot really place it. You have no encoding, so you don't know what to name it, right? But hopefully there's somebody next to you or maybe a sign that tells you, hey, this thing that you're seeing here, that's a shark. So you encode it and you save it to your long-term memory. But the very next time you come back, maybe it has been a while, it's on the tip of your tongue. Like, you've seen this creature before. You know what it is, but you cannot really reach it. That's because it hasn't been consolidated enough yet. So hopefully, again, that person is with you, or again, the sign is there to remind you, oh, that was a shark. So you can encode it again and put it in your, uh, and encode that to your long-term memory. So that eventually, hopefully, it gets consolidated and you know, okay, this is a shark. Now, the cool thing is, that recent research has shown that we never forget things. So the very first time that we encoded that shark, we placed it in our long-term memory. And then the second time we came across it and we didn't quite be able to recall it, it was not that, we, that it was not there in the long-term memory, it was just that the pathway was not strong enough, not consolidated enough for us to retrieve it. So tell that to your mom or to your partner whenever she says, like, are you forgetting again? You're so, no, I never forget things. I just fail to retrieve it. <laughs> well, in that sense, let's look at a forest. Let's say you're standing in front of an untouched forest. You've never been there before. So the very first time you make your way through that forest, you need to really make your way through, right? You need to push your branches aside, get your way through all the trees and all the, all, the, all the stuff on the ground. And when you finally came through, you are pretty sure you went there. But when you come back the next day or maybe the next week, even though you still have the scratches on your arm to prove it, it might look like you were never there. The branches have been grown back, the pathway has overgrown again. It's only when you recall it time after time again that at one point there's a clear pathway showing. So why is it then that sometimes some words or some concepts within IT are very easy for us to learn, whereas other concepts we need to go over them again and again in order to really recall and really get the whole principle? In order to know that, we need to look at how the things are stored within those storage places. So our memory is stored as a network structure. Let's take this person as an example. This person knows all of these words. Now, this person wants to learn about a new concept, the word tiger. Well, this person is in luck. He already knows a lot of words that are related to the tiger, right? So whenever he's going to learn, he has already a lot of hooks connecting to that tiger, even though he never seen or heard of a tiger before. Very different from when this person wants to learn about the word pigeon. Flying animals, you say? Yeah, that's just unnatural. Like, I heard about birds, but they don't fly, the birds that I know. So it will be take a longer period of time in order to recall it. Now, you might have noticed that I put the coloring colors into coloring, and I didn't only do that for fun, I did that because our network structure is not only built up out of words, it's also built up out of all of the senses that are related to those concepts and words that we see in our, the world around us. So whenever you think of a color, it might very well be that you're not thinking about the word of the color, not thinking about the letters black 
but you're actually seeing the color in front of you whenever you think of it. And that is with everything. So whenever we want to learn a kid about the dolphin, you want to take that kid to a zoo to show the kid the dolphin or look at a book or show a picture so that there are more pathways and it will be easier for this kid to remember this thing. And this goes for all the senses, so also smell, touch, etc. And this is what we call in uh, linguistics contextual association. It's like the correlation between your senses and the things and the concepts that you learn around you. Now, how do we bring this to IT, right? So, as you already know, I'm a Java developer, so my, my next example will be of a Java concept, records. Records came out in one of the latest long-term uh, versions. Um, and is something very cool that everybody is talking about. So I want to learn about it. Now, first things up, I am already in luck. This word is easy pronounceable and easy for me to remember, right? Very different from when I would want to learn about some PKCS11. Like, it, it already would take so much space and I, I need to go over it in order to recall even, like, the name of the topic. But I'm in luck, so that's good. Uh, now, I want to learn about the semantical and syntactical meaning, right? So this is what it is. It's like a data class with immutable data, uh, and it implements already some members for you, so that's great. Um, but now, how am I going to approach this? Especially with learning that we want to include our senses in the learning process. Well, whenever you are going to read a blog or read an article on it, I would highly suggest to you go and read it out loud. Because when you read it out loud, you first, you, you go over the page, right? Your eyes glancing over the page, you read the lines. But you are then processing that information and speaking it out loud, making that your brain is processing the text two times in the time period of one time. So it's super efficient to do it that way, right? And it will also make sure that when you want to read it out loud, you be more focused on whatever you're reading. So chances are less likely that you need to go back and reread re the paragraph because you kind of lost where you were and what you just read. Now, I can imagine that if you're an office person, not a lot of people are nowadays, but if you're an office person, your colleagues might find it a little bit annoying that you read out loud all the time. So, <laughs> so maybe we need something else. Well, you can also write a summary. Uh, I think all of us has wrote a summary during our lifetime, during high school or university or anything. Um, and the funny thing with that was that probably most of you know the feeling that when you wrote the summary, that was already a big part of your learning strategy. So after written the summary, you could already go into your test and get like a student grade, like just over um, the valid um, benchmark. So it's already a big part, so you can include that kind of stuff. But we also learned that we want to visualize stuff, right? And that is hard in IT, because IT principles are a lot of time not really visual, visual things where I have a clear image of. So that is what we call in linguistic creative contextual association, because our brain doesn't give a shit. <laughs> it doesn't matter if, it, if it's really a visual uh, image of something that exists or that you create it in order to tie it to that concept. Maybe some of you have heard of the memory palace. I'm not sure if, if people heard about that, but it ties a little bit up to that. So you connect a meaning or a concept to, some, to a visualization, even though the connection for an outsider might not feel relevant. But for you, it does. So when we go to, yeah, when we go to records back, you might say, oh, I have, I have a visualization. Like, I know a musical record, right? So I can tie it. In this specific situation, you could do that. Because a music record and an IT concept is very different, right? So if you're standing at the point of your visualization, at the point of that musical record, and you're writing in your IntelliJ or in your code editor, then you, your brain probably knows which pathway to take to the right concept. Like, should I go to the music store or should I go to like an immutable data class? 
So it probably knows. But be careful when you want to add a visualization to a concept that is within the same context. You don't want to have your brain conflicting, like which pathway should I take? So you can always come up with your own visualization. In this example, I chose for a file that has been covered by bars because I felt that the data was captured and could not be modified anymore. So be careful whenever you create a visualization. Good job, please do, uh, but be careful that you create it per context and per meaning or rule. Now let's go to kids, because as a speech and language therapist, I have been amazed by how children learn. When we grow up, we kind of forget how we learned, and we, we get learning strategies, and we, we try our best to be as efficient as possible, and that whole process can be quite frustrating, right? Like, you want, you want more <laughs> than you feel you are able to. But children learn very intuitive. They never got taught how to learn. So what now if we would go back and look at children, how do they learn so that it's more natural to us, that it doesn't really feel like we're learning all the time and that we put our effort into it. First thing that I learned from kids is that they parrot a lot. So they repeat what they hear around them. Is this going to work? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, they hear what they re <laughs> they repeat what they hear around them, and that is lovely until they get to the swear words. That's less le <laughs> less lovely. Uh, but in general, it's a good practice to parrot stuff, and we do it all the time, right? With our buddy Stack Overflow, we all parrot Stack Overflow. But is it really parroting? In order to answer that question, we need to know what is parroting. Parroting is an active way of learning. So you cannot parrot by just listening to the words around you, right? The parroting is actually the active act of repeating what you've heard around you. So you process it passively, and then you process it, and then actively you repeat that, and you, you put it in your own practice. If you want to use Stack Overflow as your parrot mechanism, then instead of copy-pasting, you need to actively apply it. So place your editor on one side of the screen, Stack Overflow on the other, and instead of copy-pasting, rewrite it, type it out, uh, let it run through your fingers. What children do after they parrot, after they learned that new word or that new concept, that is when they're going to try it out. They're going to try it out everywhere. They're going to try out, like in supermarkets, uh, suddenly everything is a banana, every cat on the street is a dog. Like, they are just trying stuff out. And that is what we should do as well, because when we have that network structure and we're learning about a new concept, we want to deepen our knowledge about that. We want to increase the pathways leading to it. And we do that by trying it out and knowing when to use it and when not to use it. But we can only do that if we have a feedback mechanism, right? If that kid would never be corrected, then it would grow up believing that cats and dogs are actually all dogs. And like they, they wouldn't know the difference because they never got corrected. And that is pretty negative because it's hard to unlearn. Because you just heard from me that you never forget things, right? Everything that you've learned is in your long-term memory. So how do we unlearn things? Well, the practice of unlearning is not so much of forgetting, because we're like it's, it is there, but it is about growing new pathways. And that is quite difficult, because for a period of time, you will have two pathways, one leading to the wrong concept and one re leading to the right concept. But you need to let the old pathway overgrown, and you need to consolidate the new pathway in order to know which pathway to take. And that is why sometimes when you're in an unlearning process, you might still make the same mistake again and again, because you ca your brain is kind of confused, and then it's like, this is the pathway I know best. So it's inefficient. We don't want to do that. And if you don't want to do that, you need to prevent it, right? And be sure you do that by finding yourself a mentor or checking out like different solutions 
on internet because the one with 100 likes on Stack Overflow might be outdated if it's five years ago. And last one I want to say about children is start easy. Something kids, you will never hear a kid say like the first word refrigerator. We'll not start with that. It will start with the basic words, right? Mom, dad, doll. Small words, words that they hear all around them and that are easy for them to capture. And we should do that as well when we're learning new concept of IT. Whenever we want to upgrade to Spring Boot 3 and we want to change our web security context, but you know nothing about the basics of security or you know nothing <laughs> about the Spring library, it will be so tough to learn about that specific uh, upgrade or that specific implementation because you don't know about the basics. So while you're in the process of learning, you're continuously feeling that you're lacking or that you cannot grasp the entire concept. So what is that about? Well, that is about something that I haven't talked about yet. I talked about memory storage, so short term and long term, but I didn't talk about how it ends up from one to the other. And that is with our working memory. And our working memory is like a process engine. I'm not sure if, yeah, perfect. It's like a process engine. And it transfers the data from short term to long term. And just as we saw before with short-term memory, also the working memory can take up two to six chunks at a time. Not a lot, right? So you might figure that we have cognitive overload, that is what we call it, if you get to the seven chunk, which is not there, and you feel frustrated. You feel like you cannot grasp the context. So be kind to yourself, because like it's not that you're dumb or anything, it's just that you you needed the other chunks, the previous chunks you needed in order to get the concept. So maybe you need to take a step back or a step higher uh, to get more knowledge about the basis before you really dive in. But also be careful to remember this, what you just now learned and heard, when you're dealing with people that are less experienced than you, with people that are more junior than you. Because you might have the feeling that you're like, I just told you that. Ye yesterday you made the same mistake, I told you what you should do, and now you're doing it again. But be patient, because that person could have, it could very well be that when you gave that piece of information, it was already the seventh chunk for that person, leading to the fact that the person was unable to process that information and really save it into the long-term memory. But what I didn't tell you is something cool. I told you about the forest. I told you that we can create a path of that. But what I didn't tell you is that you even can create highways. And highways are incredibly cool and something we all want to have because highways make sure that you pass the working memory. If you have information stored in your long-term memory that you automated enough you don't need to take up a chunk in your working memory in order to retain and use that kind of information. So let's build ourselves some highways. How can we build highways? How can we Im automate information retrieval from our long-term memory? First tip, think before you search. It might sound easy, but for a long period of our time, I actually didn't do it. Like we have Google, it's just one t like one click away, and uh, off I go. But by doing that, I prevent myself um, or I deny myself the opportunity of learning because it's like I'm in front of the forest and I I see a pathway, but I cannot quite see the end. And instead of pa or consolidating at least the first steps and maybe even during my way getting to the end. I deny myself that opportunity and I immediately turn left or right to go for my Google search. So be sure you think before you search. I bet you will see a big difference in it. Secondly, the frequency. It doesn't make a lot of sense to spend thousands of euros going to a course of a new language or a new framework and learning all about that for one, two, five days, it doesn't matter, and then not using it for half a year. 
that's really a loss of resources. And it's not that you don't have that information anymore. Like, we know that it's in a long-term memory, but all the pathways will be overgrown. It will take you a lot of time again to recall it after half a year and to revisit everything in order to dust off all those pathways. So we want to rather repeat it more often than that we go over it a longer period of time. And that's why I also added the picture of Duolingo, because who is using Duolingo? Do we have some Duolingo users? In? Yeah, we have some, cool. Well, Duolingo is a cool language uh, framework or application which we, with which you can learn new languages. Perfect, and the big advantage of Duolingo is that the lessons are very short. Like, you can do one lesson in three to five minutes. It's very short, but it really tries to recall, let it be recalled every single day. So you repeat it often instead of having a longer session. Then flashcards. We might have all have used it when we were younger, like it's something that maybe our moms or like the teachers told us, but we can still use it nowadays. And a flashcard is something that on one side you have either a visualization or a concept, and on the other, uh, you have something to remember it by. Now, it would be cool if you create those flashcards yourself, but nowadays we have applications. Anki and Quizlet are two applications that are very easy to use, and you can use it, uh, even the flashcards or the decks of other users, in order to learn about a new concept. Then, a dictionary. If you want to learn about a new dictionary, I mentioned how important it is to have multiple hooks, multiple pathways leading to that concept. So what do you do with a dictionary? You write down everything you know about it. You write down monomics, you write, di write down the pros and cons, you write down the scenarios in which to use it and which not to use it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As much as possible so that you deepen your knowledge about it. And if you want to take that to another level, you introduce study time. Study time is something like it's a moment in time on a dedicated point in time. So you, let's say every Friday at 8.30, I have my study time. And it doesn't need to be longer than 30 minutes. Really, it doesn't. Because our short-term memory and our working memory doesn't have a lot of slots in order to really, really dive in any deeper. So take 30 minutes of focus time without distractions to really dive into it. And after that, it's time to really use it. So in the next week, you're going to see if you can use it during your work. And even though there will be some days that it doesn't, it isn't the right fit, like you cannot use it in your day-to-day -day practice, the fact that you had a moment to think about it and you remembered, oh, well, can I use it? Oh, I cannot. Even the fact that you thought about that is already deepening your, your sense of it because you, you remembered or you, you um, confided in yourself like it is not possible to use it there, right? So after a week, you're going to evaluate Maybe you didn't know something yet, like something you figured out, so you're going to add that to everything you have written down during your study time. And last but not least, explain it to others. Because, first of all, if you are able to explain it to others, that will be a great satisfaction for yourself that you are able to tell it to someone else, because that really gives you um, Oh, that gives a way that you really understand the concept, right? And if you're not a speaker, if you're not someone that's comfortable in front of crowds, you can also write a blog about it, right? It's not, you can find something that suits you. But the importance of learning together, I cannot press enough. And I don't need to tell you that because you're all here on a conference, so you understand the meaning of community, right? But it is so important to learn together and to talk about new concepts and new techniques and inspire each other. But be careful of the curse of expertise. I'm talking here today about learning, and there's a funny thing that's called the curse of expertise, and that is that we kind of forget where we came from when we're longer in the field. We kind of forget that we were juniors once. We were kind of forget that we had cognitive overflow the entire time. 
Um, so be patient with your fellow juniors or your fellow colleagues um, when, when they have a hard time learning all the new principles. And be kind to yourself. Well, with that being said, um, I have here a few sources, if it's going to click through. Yeah. Oh, the key takeaways. The contextual association, so use as much senses in your learning process as possible. Actively apply, so the copy-pasting, not great for learning new things. Uh, find someone that can correct you so that you prevent yourself from unlearning. Uh, automate everything that you can for your long-term memory because it will make you more efficient uh, and giving you the opportunity to learn new concepts and learn together. Those are my sources. The first one, uh, The Programmer's Brain of Pauline uh, Hermans, I can really recommend if you like this topic. Uh, it is full with practical tips uh, and tricks on this topic. So uh, feel free to invest in that. And with that being said, thank you for your attention. These are my credentials and uh, have a great day.